who is not interested in human consciousness. I mean, I've always taken it as a premise that, that human beings are philosophers by nature, and of course psychologists too. So um, I, I became interested in consciousness specifically, though, because I have been concerned with the evolution of intelligence and the brain, and since one of the uh, most significant functions of the brain is to deliver consciousness, I wanted to tie in my own research with what's the most significant question for everybody in any case. <clears throat> In my own case, the most the seminal experience was working on blind sight. Um, nearly 50 years ago, it's more than 50 years ago now, I had the opportunity to study a monkey in the Cambridge laboratory who had had the visual cortex of her brain removed. Um, and she was completely blind to begin with, but I had a hunch that she wasn't blind. And when my supervisor, this monkey belonged to him, when he went away to a conference, I went and sat with the monkey and just played with her and interacted. And within a few days, it was clear that she wasn't blind. Um, I sent a telegram to Larry Weiskrantz in Basel saying, I've taught Helen, Helen was the monkey, I've taught her to see. Um, he came back in not so good temper and he wouldn't even look at the monkey. And I said, look, you have to come and look. Um, and he agreed, this monkey apparently was developing vision again. This was two years after the operation, entirely removing the visual cortex. I then got permission to spend the next seven years with that monkey. Uh, I interacted with her in, all, in, in, in a very natural way. I would take her for walks in the field and so on. And it, within really a short time, certainly within a few months at the beginning, she was developing a very considerable degree of vision. By the end of seven years, you couldn't have distinguished her from a normal monkey. But, you, well, you could, because there were some significant kind of psychological changes. She didn't seem to believe that she could see. Um, she, when she was anxious, for example, then suddenly she'd become blind again. She could only see when she didn't, seem, when she didn't have to try too hard to see. Now, that, that was in 1970 or so, I guess. Um, I wrote a paper saying, I called it, a paper was called Seeing and Nothingness. Um, and I suggested then that if only we could redefine what we mean by seeing, even in humans, we might find out that there's some very significant possibilities uh, even for the, for the human brain. Shortly after that, Larry Weiskrantz, my supervisor, began to work with humans with striate cortex lesions and discovered the phenomenon which is now known as blind sight. Blind sight is unconscious vision. Um, vision in which the subject will deny that he can see. It's not, not like anything to see. There are no sensations. And yet, if the subject is asked to guess what might be there, if he could see, he'll get it right. He can guess the position of a light. He can guess the shape of a, an object. He can even guess the color. He'll say, yeah, well, I guess that might be red. But there's no sensation associated with it. So uh, that, that set me going. I mean, if... I had a monkey who apparently had, had developed this capacity, um, but lacking something. The human case suggested exactly what she was lacking. She was lacking the ability for conscious sensation. And so that set me to ask, well, if you can see without sensation, then why does it exist? Why has that kind of phenomenal consciousness evolved? And really through my work since then, I've been developing ideas around that. Um, I also became very interested in consciousness for another reason, which is that I was speculating about the evolution of social intelligence. Um, I'd had the opportunity to work with gorillas in Africa with Diane Fossey. And while I was there, it became clear to me that the evolution of the brain, at least for those apes, had more to do with social life than with any other cognitive function to do with you know, geography or technology or anything else. I then applied that idea to humans and said, well, of course, actually, consciousness in humans is very largely used for speculating about the contents of another person's mind. Um, now, put that together with my earlier work, what we're speculating about is the existence of phenomenal consciousness. When I look at you and try to think what it would be like to be you, I imagine the same, very same phenomena in your mind as I find in mine. You're having sensations of, you're in pain, you're seeing red, you're, you're, you're feeling the wind on your face, and you're having this very extraordinary, almost magical experience. So, and yet it's, it's evolved. This is, you know, something introduced into the world by natural selection. And so I came to put all this together and really um, spent, I've spent the last 30 years trying to develop in more detail what kind of explanation we can give.
Why does consciousness seem so difficult to explain? Um, why does it seem to be immaterial, as if it can't actually be a product of, you know, of the hard matter of the universe? And my answer is a surprising one. I think consciousness is difficult to explain because that's its function. We want to believe that consciousness is special and different and out of this world, because if consciousness is out of this world, then I'm out of this world, you're out of this world too. Um, and so we, we develop a kind of idea about the metaphysical significance of what it is to be an individual human being, which I then extend to you, which actually, um, this may sound very grand, but gives us a new reason for living, a new in reason for developing our projects in the world and so on, and for caring about our own future and about the future of the other people whom we love. So... Um, my, I've often said now that my solution to the hard problem of consciousness is that it's designed to be hard.